very, very excited about this next portion. Uh, we are uh, just thrilled to have uh, Tim Hague Sr. with us. Tim has thrilled audiences of all sizes with his message of perseverance in the face of suffering, character development, and of hope. He overcame the odds when he went from a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease to just three years later becoming the inaugural winner of CTV's The Amazing Race Canada. Tim and his son, Tim, Day, uh, Tim Hay Jr., put their now trademark perseverance to work while participating as a duo on The Amazing Race Canada. The Tims, as the viewers affectionately dubbed them, kept their focus on overcoming one obstacle at a time to take the championship. So we are very excited to have Tim Hay as our keynote address. Would you give him a warm welcome? And he's going to start with a video, but let's give him a warm welcome. Well, thank you for bringing me back to Regina. I have nothing but the fondest memories of running a little race here in Regina. If you had the opportunity to watch a show, you will recall that in Regina, we got to go through a truckload of lentils. <laughs> Ours weren't, wasn't too bad. We were 40 minutes. We were in and out fairly quick. However, Brett and Holly, the doctors, Helen and Joanne, body break, they spent almost three hours in that pot of soup. And I do mean it was a pot of soup, a, a steel semi full of lentils, hunting for two little moose with uh, clues on them in 30 degree weather. It was an ugly day. They finally took a penalty, got out, went on. We ended up at Mosaic Stadium. I ended up having to wear that green outfit. <laughs> I am from Winnipeg. <laughs> I won't tell you what I tell Winnipeggers about that. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. But that day, we had the opportunity to U-turn Hal and Joe, sent them home packing, and, well, became, became what I like to say Canada's most hated for a little while. But we had a great time in Regina, and it's great to be back. I always enjoy talking to folks with Parkinson's. Somehow it's close to my heart. Leg, toe, arm, <laughs> head, left side. <laughs> it's good to be here. How many of you had the opportunity to watch this show, The Amazing Race? Excellent, well, that's pretty good, it's pretty good. How many of you didn't? Now you're among friends, so go ahead, stick your hand up. How many of you didn't get to see the show? Go ahead. Go ahead. One question. What do you do with your life? <laughs> it was the most watched television show of all, all time. Take it far, as far back as those black and white televisions we began with. It's the most watched television show in Canadian history. And we had a fabulous time. Well, it's, as you probably know, it's a reality television show. We raced across Canada, literally coast to coast to coast. Started off in Kelowna made our way as far as Cape Spear, Newfoundland, the most easterly point in North America, all the way up to Iqaluit, Nunavut, and as far south as Regina, Saskatchewan. And we had a great time chasing across the country, trying to find a bunch of clues, trying to perform a bunch of challenges, and not make complete fools out of ourselves on national television. So we went lots of places, saw lots of things. Stayed in Canada that first season. Season two, they went outside of Canada, went to France and to Hong Kong. I am very happy that we stayed at home. It was a great opportunity to show off Canada, I think, and to uh, show all these beautiful places uh, that we often don't go as Canadians. So we had a just absolutely incredible time. And I can't tell you how much good has come out of it since then. So I'll tell you a few little stories this morning. I started off the race by waking up one morning in a hotel in downtown Toronto. It was the Fairmont Royal York Hotel, and I woke up with two thoughts going through my head. Number one, I knew I was living the dream because as a nurse, I could not afford to be staying in this hotel on my salary. <laughs> the second was I woke up to the voices of my 15-year-old twins ringing in my ears, saying, Dad, if you don't accomplish anything on this show, if you don't do anything, if you don't accomplish anything else, please don't do this. Don't embarrass us. <laughs> How many of you have twins? Oh, good, 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 nice. I've never asked that question before. It just came to mind. So can you, you can imagine a boy and a girl, dad going on national tele television, what's going through their minds, right? 
So anyway, we kick off the race. We started in Niagara Falls, made our way over to Kelowna. Um, well, in Niagara Falls, we, if you watch the show, you recall that we had that first challenge of the butterflies. We managed to take only one clue instead of two, thus incurring a 30-minute penalty, the very first shot out of the gate. Cost us six, uh, 30 minutes at the end of the race, so instead of fifth place, we ended up in sixth. Fortunately, not coming in last. Fortunately, saving the mental health of my teenagers. And the twins on the race took that auspicious title of being the first to be eliminated on the first leg of the first season of the first The Amazing Race Canada. Made our way over to Kelowna. Through Kelowna, got to Vancouver. Spent some time in Vancouver hunting around through Chinatown, through a lion dance, through a tea challenge, bunch of nonsense that we got lost in. Got through the second challenge, made our way back over to Alberta, got to Calgary, experienced a little lion dance. <laughs> yeah, you remember, I know. It'll never be a wiped from your memory, and I'm going to show you again. <laughs> Made it through Cal Calgary, only to end up in a little place drum called Drumheller. You ever have one of those days? Everything you touch falls apart, turns dash in your, in your hands, feels like you're grasping at sand. Well, that was Alberta for us. I want you to know that 25 years ago when I moved to Winnipeg, I got myself into a little line dance down at a place called the Forks doing the boot scoot and boogie. I took home good football tickets, blue bomber tickets, because I won that dance. <laughs> there is a day that this black man could dance. <laughs> Give him Parkinson's, eh, not so much. That day was absolutely frustrating. Tim Jr. there says, I know exactly where Horse Thief Canyon Overlook is. I remember passing it. No, he saw Horseshoe Canyon. <laughs> we needed Horse Thief Canyon Overlook. We go 15 minutes in the wrong direction, end up coming in last. We were absolutely frustrated. Everything we touched was wrong, messed up, not working for us. I wasn't eating well that day. I wasn't drinking well. I wasn't sleeping. I was frustrated by my Parkinson's. Over and over and over again that day, everything just seemed to go wrong. We ended up heading up to the mat there jogging up knowing full well that I had no better than a 50-50 chance of staying in this race that particular day. We knew the race, my wife's a bit of a fanatic. I figured there's always two non-elimination legs in a race. This was leg three. I knew it would probably come in leg three or four, so I knew I had about a 50-50 chance of staying in the race that day. As we come up to the map there and John says to us, boys, this, you're the last team to arrive? Yeah. Figured as much. However, well, however is now my most favored word in the English language. <laughs> however, this is a non-elimination leg, and you are still in this race. You see me grab my forehead, all three acres of it. <laughs> Good farmers in the crowd. And I'm absolutely thrilled. I'm thrilled, first of all, that I have avoided the embarrassment of the elimination. I'm thrilled that we've dodged the bullet of being sent home early. My spirits go absolutely, yeah, no, <laughs> all in the same second. Because, yeah, I'm not going home. I've not been eliminated. But then I have this stark reality hit my mind. I'm not going home. <laughs> I have to keep doing this. And there was about 10% of me that simply wanted to stop. I was tired, I was frustrated, wasn't having a whole lot of fun, and I just wanted to go home. Well, that evening, Tim Jr. and I go back to our hotel, and if you've ever been to Drumheller, you know that that's where God sent all the dinosaurs to die. <laughs> so we go back to our dinosaur hotel, we sit down and we start having a conversation. What are we going to do? What are we going to do to fix this thing? We are on the verge of making fools out of ourselves on national television. And what in the world are we going to do? 
Well, I don't know how the conversation came around to it, but eventually the conversation came around to my son's two tattoos. I have four children. The first two came out of the womb saying, Daddy, I want a tattoo. <laughs> Daddy has always said no. Said so on your 18th birthday, you go do to your body whatever you want to do, but until that time, no tattoos. On their 18th birthdays, they both had tattoos. I'm not sure what that says about my parenting, but I can't complain too much about the tattoos. He ended up with one here on his inner, inner arm that is a symbol for the Christian Trinity. The other one on his back is a passage from the Christian scriptures. It comes from Psalms 46.10. It is two words. It says, cease striving. As we talked that evening, we came around to the word striving, and we started talking about what it meant to strive. Well, we weren't sure, so we looked it up. We went to Mr. Google. You find that the word strive means to struggle or to fight forcefully. It comes from the old English, to contend, to quarrel, to fight. It has also the old French for the word strife. It carries with it a burden of anxiety. It's that freaked out, stressed out state of mind that says, by God, I am going to make this happen no matter what it takes. And we realized that's how we were running our race. We came into the show going to win this thing no matter what it took. And unfortunately, the stark reality was it wasn't working for us. So we made a decision that evening that we were simply going to stop. And we're going to stop racing, we're going to keep racing, but we're going to stop this line of thinking. And we were going to start over. We realized, how can you be on the Amazing Race Canada? There were 10,000 teams that applied to be where we were at. We were one of nine teams selected out of 10,000 applicants. How can you have a, achieved this kind of success how can you be in this kind of place, be given this opportunity, and not at the very least be having fun? There's a problem. Not with the race, not with how it's being played, but there's a problem with us. So we decided we were first of all going to start having fun. And two, we're gonna start doing our best. We're gonna wake up every morning and simply move forward with the intention of doing our very best. Now, it always concerns me at this point in my speech that I've just lost half of you. Because a bunch of you aren't like me. A lot of you made 4.0s and 4.5s in school and wondered what the rest of us at the back of the class were doing. What I just said could come across as, oh, the Tims were struggling, so they decided to stop what they were doing, start having fun, and do their best it can come off as a little trite, as a little silly, as a little overly simplistic. I want to remind you of an old adage that each of you have heard many, many times, and it goes like this. Everything you ever really needed to know, you learned in kindergarten. My kindergarten teacher was Mrs. Popovich. Mrs. Popovich has long since passed away, but I remember Mrs. Popovich well, not only for the swats that she gave me, but uh, I am that old. <laughs> but for the admonition that she would give me most every day of kindergarten, we would start off our day in kindergarten almost the same every single day, and that would be with Mrs. Popovich saying, Timmy, shut up. <laughs> I've never had a problem talking. Now, while that's a little bit of an exaggeration, the important thing that she would say to me every day would be, Timmy, just do your best. You remember your teachers telling you? Just do your best. Slow down, pay a little attention, stop talking, just do your best. That day in Drumheller, Tim Jr. and I decided to go back to kindergarten. We decided that we would take the advice of Mrs. Popovich and that we would simply start having fun in this incredible opportunity that we've been given and day after day get up and do our best you will recall that we were not necessarily the prettiest team on the race. We were not the fastest. We were not the strongest. 
We were not the funniest. You will recall that we ran that classic underdog race. We were the come from behind Cinderella story that nobody expected to happen. We were error prone and chronically behind. We had multiple opportunities to roll over and die, knowing full well that nobody would have been surprised and few would have mourned our passing. <laughs> we struggled all the time, kind of like we are with the sound system today. <laughs> uh, posture check. You like that, eh? <laughs> it's a way to take your mind off of what, uh, what I just said. <laughs> we struggled ongoing. We were that classic underdog team. But day after day, we chose to get up, have fun, do our best, and simply carry on. Now, I would like to suggest to you that with our newfound state of mind, with our newfound sense of purpose and direction, that our gameplay radically changed. However, it did not. We continued to suck. <laughs> this is where the race taught us the meaning of the word perseverance. And once again, when we came to the word perseverance, this great big long word, we realized that Tim Jr. couldn't pronounce it and I didn't remember what it meant, so we had to go back to Mr. Google. See, I'm in that strange age. I, I don't do dictionaries anymore. I have to do Google. Some of you still do dictionaries, you do, but you know what Google is, right? <laughs> went, to, went to Google, Googled the word perseverance, found this definition. To carry on in a course of action, even in the face of difficulty, with little or no evidence of success. Once again, to carry on in a course of action, even in the face of difficulty, with little or no evidence of success. If you Google the word perseverance, you will find that definition and alongside it, the faces of the Tims. <laughs> because never did we ever, ever give you any indication that we would be successful, did we? No. For example, how many of you in the room wa who watched the show thought that the Tims would one day win? <laughs> oh, see this, uh, oh. Thank you. There's always one. <laughs> I was going to say there's absolutely none. There's always one, and I appreciate you, but no. No. We never, ever gave you any indication that we would ever be successful. We got lost over and over. You recall, in Kelowna, we got lost. Niagara Falls, the butterflies, we got lost. In Iqaluit, looking for the, the, uh, the Northwest or the Provincial Park, the Territorial Park is what I'm trying to say, we got lost. In Quebec City, I stopped a mailman and asked him for directions. He sent us left when he should have sent us right, and we got lost. In Cape Spear, Newfoundland, we were effectively in the semis. There were four teams left. We were in third position. All we had to do was get to the mat and we'd be racing for half a million dollars in cash and prizes, and we got lost. In the Toronto Zoo, <laughs> three teams left. The Tims managed to do in an hour and a half what the other two teams did in 15 minutes because we got lost. Over and over and over and over. We exhibited no evidence that we would ever be successful. Yet that day in Drumheller, we decided that regardless, we were going to get up every day, do our best to simply have fun, simply do our best, and persevere to carry on. People have asked me over time, where does this attitude, where does this will to persevere come from? Well, for me, it started in August of 2010. I was sitting in my kitchen, reading the Saturday morning newspaper, as I often do, when a brand new thought entered my consciousness. That thought was, my left big toe is twitching. Now, I know I have one nurse in the room. Any others? Okay. What's a good nurse do when they find themselves twitching? Do a quick little head-to-toe assessment. 
uh, what's going on here? Because we know that there's no good reason for us to just be twitchy. So I started off with the psychological side of things. I wasn't anxious, wasn't depressed, the kids were okay, the job was all right, the wife wasn't mad at me today. <laughs> job was good, life in general was fine. There was no psychological reason for me to be twitchy. So if you're as a nurse, and I'd been nursing 18 years at the time, as, as a nurse you know that if it's not psychological, then it's likely physiological. If it's physiological, it's probably neurological. And if it's neurological, it's probably Parkinson's or MS. You see, my father had had Parkinson's for many years. I have a half-sister who has MS. That was literally the first five minutes of my journey with this thing called Parkinson's disease. That was August. My wife and I had just crossed our 25th wedding anniversary that July. We had plans to go to Europe for three weeks that October. So like any good husband, gentlemen, I did what? Not a thing. <laughs> Zip it. Quiet. Don't say anything. I might be wrong. It might go away. Why worry her? Well, I learned a hard lesson, or at least an interesting lesson. We go off to Europe. We decided to do in our 40s what you're supposed to do in your 20s, which was backpack across Europe. We booked our hotel in Madrid, booked our hotel in Athens, and for three weeks, nothing in between. It was a little anxiety producing to wind up in Rome on a Saturday night with no hotel and nothing available. Suddenly I found that my toe tremor turned into a foot tremor that turned into a leg tremor that turned into me saying, something's wrong with me. <laughs> and she being the fabulous wife that she is says, look, look, settle down. First of all, we'll get a hotel. And we did, we found a very nice, very expensive, just spent my, the cost of my firstborn on it, but. <laughs> found a very nice hotel, and she said, you're fine, you will be fine, we'll carry on our vacation, we'll get home, talk to the doc, figure out what this is, and go on from there. We get back home, I sit down with my GP, who had been my doctor for many years, sat in his office, and for 20 minutes we talked about the fact that I likely had young, young onset Parkinson's disease. He said, but we will do our tests, get you to see a neurologist and we'll, we'll get a formal diagnosis. I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Andy Boris, the Movement Disorder Clinic in Winnipeg. And in February of 2011, he formally diagnosed me with young onset Parkinson's disease. I was 46 years young. To say that I was unimpressed would be the understatement of a lifetime. I was ticked, I was angry, I was mostly scared. Like I said, my father had had Parkinson's, I have been a nurse now for 20 years. I have nursed everyone from the very beginnings of Parkinson's right through death. I came into this with no illusion as to what this diagnosis might hold for me. I unfortunately went on to do what many of us do with this kind of wonderful news. I got depressed, got down, stopped running, stopped cycling, stopped doing the things that I knew I should do to look after myself, and parked myself on the couch. After about a year of that nonsense, I said, hey, this isn't you, this isn't how you respond to these kind of things, you need to get off the couch and get back to life, get going again. So I did, I got up, started running again, started cycling, that next year ran my first triathlon. I should say first and last. <laughs> Not a bad comeback, but I think those days are done. I got up and got going again. I basically looked at this disease, that there was three ways that I could look at it. I could try to treat it in the typical guy fashion. I could try to sit back and say it's benign, it doesn't matter, I can set it on the shelf and ignore it. How many of you here with Parkinson's get to ignore it every day? <laughs> doesn't happen. Learned that pretty quick. Well, if it's not benign and can't be ignored, it could be a curse. I could choose to live under it, I could, allow it to consume me. I could allow it to consume my job and my relationships, my wife and my children and my world. And at the end of that thought and discussion, that just simply didn't sound like that much fun. So I didn't want to go down that particular road. So if it's not benign and it's not a curse, 
I may be simple kind of guy, but the only other thing I could figure out is that this must be a blessing. There must be something in this that is both good for me and for those around me. So I got up from that point and decided to, to walk through life with Parkinson's as a blessing. Now, is it progressive? I am worse off today than I was four and a half years ago. Absolutely. I'm not running. I cycle a little bit. I don't think I will be doing any more triathlons. It is what it is. It is progressive, but there are things I can still do to slow it. I do walk. I do cycle. I do yoga. I stretch because it makes a huge difference in my ability to function. I have caught friends back home that if I could just get them doing yoga and stretching with me, I am sure I would change their world. But do you think I can get some of these 40, 50 year old guys to do yoga? <laughs> we don't do spandex. <laughs> so don't. <laughs> just stretch. It may be progressive, but there are things I can do to slow it. It may one day be debilitating, but not today. It may very well impact my death one day. But today, I am very much alive and well. Thus, when I walked into the amazing race, I walked into it with the same attitude that I walked through life with, and that is, Parkinson's cannot have my life, and it could not have or take the Amazing Race Canada away from me. Thus, when I stood on a plank, a 12-inch wide plank, 50 feet in the air over a gorge in Kelowna, BC, I said, I will walk this plank, shuffle if I may, and I will not fall off. When I sat in front of 10 pieces of muktuk, whale blubber, and a callowit, I said, I will eat this and I will not throw up. <laughs> All the while having my mother's voice ringing in my ears, I hope you have one just like you. <laughs> Thanks, Ma. Thanks. But the fact is, we all know it's hard. We know it's difficult. Day after day after day after day. Because the thing that I find with this disease that is so different from so many other things is that it's unrelenting. We don't get to go get chemo and get rid of it. We don't get to go get a below the knee amputation and just deal with it. It's always coming. It's always coming. And that's the hardest thing that I deal with, is the fact that it's always coming. It's going to get worse. And that makes me a little nuts. That's why I have a good wife. But let me tell you a story. And this is what helps me to a large degree, this little story. Week after week, when the race was playing on television, we would hold what we called viewing parties all around Winnipeg. Some days at our church, some days at a theater. We packed out a theater of 250 some people, charged them to come in to watch the show with us, sent all that money to Parkinson Society of Manitoba. Held it in Boston Pizzas, fill up the lounge, part of the restaurant, we'd sit and watch it all together. This particular evening, it's uh, episode six. We're in Quebec City. It's the second non alem We had gotten lost. We were coming in last. And here we are with all of our friends and family. There was probably over 100 people jammed into this restaurant. And there, we're coming up to the mat. We're jogging around the corner. We're coming up to the mat. And as we come up to the mat, have you ever heard the loser clap? <laughs> well. <laughs> Way to go, boys. Good job, boys. You know, you're from Winnipeg. I had a bunch of nurse friends there. We know you, you're a good guy. You got on the show. You suck. <laughs> but you made it, right? We're getting the loser clap. And it hurts. <laughs> but then it dawned on me. For one brief moment, four people in that room, my wife, my son, my daughter-in-law, myself, we stood there like gods because we knew the future. 
We knew that not only was this a non-elimination leg, we knew that we went on to win the whole thing. We come up to the mat, John says, boys, you're the last team to arrive. And now I'm standing there with this big goofy grin on my face because I'm sure we've got this one. I'm sure it's a non -alem. He says, however, <laughs> this is a non-elimination leg and your wives are gonna have to live without you for just a little bit longer. The room absolutely exploded in cheers. I'm running around the room high-fiving everybody. It's almost as good as actually winning the whole thing because somehow we've managed to escape death's grip again. And here's the takeaway. Over and over and over again, throughout the race, I struggled with my Parkinson's. I struggled with fatigue. I struggled with the inability to read a map. There were so many times that the Thames could have listened to that loser clap and simply have given in. There is no one in this room that would have ever said, guys, what happened? If we had chosen to just step back, to mentally check out, to just relax, let the race go where it goes, see what happens, come in last again the next time and, and go home. None of you would have ever said, but guys, you were so close. We were never so close. <laughs> None of you would have blamed us if we'd just given up. Because we never, ever, gave you any reason to hope. Yet the reality is this. The championship had one name written on it. Only one. And that name was the Thames. Had we given up, had we stepped back, had we chosen to do anything differently than to get up every day and have fun, enjoy this ride, simply do our best, and persevere, we would have sacrificed a championship that had our name on it. Every day that you get up, and you face this thing. Remember us. Remember us. We were never the prettiest. We were never the strongest. We sure weren't the funniest, and we weren't the smartest. But by golly, there was a championship waiting for us that had our name on it. There is success. There is a future. There is good things in your future. Despite this doggone disease that we've been given. Remember the Tims. You don't have to be the best. It doesn't have to be the prettiest doesn't have to look great. We just have to persevere together. We can choose how we walk through life with this thing. We can choose. We can allow it to define us. It can make us into something ugly. It can consume us and take our world or we can allow it to refine us and make us better. I am reminded often of the analogy of a mighty oak tree. How do you grow a mighty oak? You don't set it in a greenhouse, water it a little bit every day and throw some food on it. You set it out on a bald prairie in Manitoba or Saskatchewan. 
You let it get rained on and sleeted on and hailed on and snowed on. You let it go through minus 40 in the winter and plus 30 in the summer. And as we go through our trials, as we suffer, just like a mighty oak, our roots go down deep. It finds solid rock to hold on to. And as our roots go deep, what happens up top? Our branches grow wide. They leaf. They become shelter, shade, and comfort for those around us. Giant sequoias down in California, standing hundreds of feet tall, so big and so huge that you can take and cut a hole through the middle of them and drive a car through them. Completely different root structure. Doesn't go deep. They reach out and they grab one another's arms. One sequoia holding on to another. And in community, they stand tall with strength and beauty and majesty. And we may shake, but maybe it's just a little swaying in the wind as we hold on to one another. We have a choice of how we walk through life with this disease. It can define us, or it can refine us. We can stand together, and when we stand together, we stand strong. Part of the work that I do to try to live out some of this, I spend lots of time with the Parkinson's Society of Canada. My support group, my exercise group, the stuff that I do to try to raise awareness and funds for Parkinson's. Another one that I do is Compassion Canada. The reason I do this, Compassion is a child sponsorship program like World Vision. We feed, clothe, educate, attempt to set free from poverty kids in third world countries who are far worse off than I am. I do this to get out of my own head. Everything else that I do, whatever it is to do with Parkinson's, directly or indirectly comes back to me. Compassion reminds me that I am among one of the most fortunate people on the planet, Parkinson's included. I have an opportunity to travel to Columbia to horrible places and to help people who have nothing to do with Parkinson's who have nothing to do with me. And I encourage you in that, to at some point in your world, get outside of yourself. Get outside of Parkinson's and offer hope to others. Throughout the course of the race, people often said to me, Tim, you are an extremely lucky man. You have got more horseshoes buried around your person than any 10 people I know. And they would be absolutely correct in making that analysis. We were extremely lucky. You do not get through the Amazing Race Canada hitting two non-elimination legs and going on and winning it without being extraordinarily lucky. Matter of fact, it's happened very, very few times. You don't hit both non-elims and win, not normally. But what those folks have sometimes forgotten is the flags and the flowers. You see, my wife is a fanatic when it comes to all things The Amazing Race Canada. Before we ever left on the race, there's a whole story I could tell you about why my son and I ran instead of her, but she made that decision. But before the way back, she always said, if the race ever comes to Canada, we're applying. When it came to Canada, I, she said, we're applying. I said, yes, dear. She goes, <laughs> she goes and looks at the rules, finds out that we have to be away from home for five weeks. Well, nobody in their right mind leaves their 15-year-old twins at home alone for five weeks. <laughs> so she comes back and she says, you and I can't go, but you and Tim Jr. can. And we get into this ridiculous conversation about who should go, because I'm like, neither one of us are going to get on the show. But she goes on and puts forward the argument that they're going to love my Parkinson's, yada, 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 and we need to go. So 
and the, the long and short is I end up on the race because of my Parkinson's. I did this the other day. I think this is Parkinson's now because my mind goes blank on a minute <laughs> on the spot. Flags and the flowers. She told us before we ever left, pay attention. I said, excuse me? She said, pay attention. At the end of the race, there will always be something that you need to remember, reproduce, redo, something. Pay attention. When we got to Kelowna, that very first clue that I received had at the top of it the rising sun of the BC flag. I heard a voice. Pay attention. I wrote that down. You saw there in Calgary, in Alberta, the, the cowboy, white hat, brown vest, brown chaps. Do you see what he had on his lapel? Wild rose. In Kelowna, she had the dogwood flower of BC. I heard a little voice. Pay attention. I wrote it down. Every morning and every evening, the Tims wrote down the flag and the flower that was presented to us. When we got to that last challenge in Toronto, there was a great big board set up, so, board that, so big that I needed a stepladder to get up to the top of it. Two stacks of wooden pitchers, one stack of territorial and provincial flags, another stack of territorial and provincial flowers. There was only one team that finished this task, there was one, only one old man with Parkinson's disease who got it done in 10 minutes and two tries because he paid attention, because he got up every morning with the will to simply have fun, the strength to do his best, the courage to be content with what is best produced, and the will to persevere. And that perseverance, ladies and gentlemen, led to this. Somehow I never get tired of watching that. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I understand the hard reality of this disease called Parkinson's. Without a cure, it may very well one day win the war that I wage with it. However, today's battle is mine. Parkinson's cannot and will not have my life today. It could not take the Amazing Race Canada away from me, and neither can it have my today. I have come to understand this. It is not about winning all the time. We get up day after day and feel like that we have lost something, that we have been robbed of some function, of some ability. However, it is about getting up every day and having the strength to do your best, whatever that best looks like, to live your best, having the courage to be content with what your best is today, and then having the will to persevere. Because you can do more than you think you can. And you have no idea where your best will take you. It is out of this place that I encourage you to persevere. Have the strength to do your best. Have the courage to be content. Have the will to persevere. And having done your best, stop there. Stop and leave room in your lives to offer hope to others. Thank you for letting me come share my story with you today. It is always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you as you struggle forward. I, 
I wish you all the best. I'll answer three questions for you that I always get asked. <laughs> now, the top three questions, did you keep the cars? <laughs> no, I live in Winnipeg. <laughs> if, you, if you think you've got bad streets, come and see mine. They're horrendous, and no, you don't keep a Corvette. I, I don't keep a Corvette in Winnipeg, that's crazy. I went and bought a Toyota Sienna Stingray. That's a joke. <laughs> Corvette Stingray, Toyota Sienna. Uh, the, the trips, 10 trips for two, anywhere in the world Air Canada flies. Uh, my wife and I ended up taking our other kids to France for three weeks, spent a week in Paris, three weeks down on the French uh, Riviera. Oh my good gracious, so nice. Wife and I went to Croatia for two weeks, Phenomenal. Uh, she and I went to Vietnam for two weeks. Uh, made our way to Colombia on a slightly different trip with Compassion. Tim Jr. went to Australia for a couple of weeks with his wife. They went to Chile. Uh, he went to um, Japan with his brother-in-law for a couple of weeks and then they made a little trip to New York. Uh, $250,000 to split between two guys doesn't allow you to retire, but it does make a heck of a dent in the mortgage. And that's, that's where that money went. I continue to be very busy speaking and uh, whatnot. If you want to follow me, Tim Haig Sr., timsenior.ca, and you can keep track of where I'm at and what I'm doing, trying to raise awareness and funds for our very worthy cause. Thank you again. All the best. God bless.